we are joined by Lyman Stone. Um, if you, you know, I might not have the most updated CV because you are a very busy man, but so you're all over the Institute for Family <laughs> Studies as a head honcho fellow extraordinaire on Budsman Czar, um, as well as AEI and all sorts of respectable institutions. Um, as well as a lot of things, I think a lot of our listeners will know you from Twitter, where you're given to very detailed, you know, 20 tweet threads or so with lots of charts and graphs that I always appreciate seeing. So, um, Lyman, it's great to have you with us. It's good to be on the podcast. Awesome. So I thought, you know, as I was preparing for this podcast, I, I thought I'd start by just sort of zooming out and seeing from your perspective early into the Biden administration here, 2021, sort of coming out of COVID and across the breadth of the areas that you study as an agricultural economist, demographer, and sort of social capital researcher, where you think we are at a super broad level in the US at this moment? Like if you were describing to a Martian or a resurrected John Adams or something like, all right, so here's a sense of going on, and then we'll dive into the specifics from there. But how are you feeling right now politically? Uh, well, I guess I, um, you know, there's, there's always two ways to sort of uh, characterize your identity. And one is to um, sort of attempt to represent your internal life. Uh, through description of your, your thoughts and, and feelings and things like that. Uh, and the other is to, is to attempt the description that the Martian would give of your, your external life, right? Uh, and so I would say that that, that description is, is sometimes more useful and I think perhaps a more honest portrayal of who we really are and what we really believe. And so the Martian would note that uh, about a year ago, I, I paid my dues and became a member of ASP. So that's about how oh. I'm feeling. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> All right. I can really take registration as a Republican because I, I, you know, I want to vote in the, the primaries in, in my, my home state. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, uh, I guess ASP wasn't on the ballot in Kentucky, so I voted for Kanye. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's about where I am politically right now is just like a plague on both your houses. And nothing Biden has done has really like made me feel that that's that that's um, that that's an overreaction. Yeah, like what have been the biggest moves so far? Like, what's your assessment compared to other sort of first ninety days administrations? You know, I'm um, I'm a whippersnapper. Uh, I just hit my third <laughs> date about two weeks ago, so uh, I can't really say like well all the other first hundred days that I've that I've uh, gotten to commentate on this one's different in this way um, but uh, I mean he's been busy right uh, so like the the big child tax credit expansion I think is great um, not least because uh, I have a baby due right at the end of 2020 so like I'll get like a double whammy on it um, but uh, but you know I, it's this is great like you know the U.S. should have a child allowance it's, it's, I'm interested to see how the monthly delivery goes when they start that in, um, I think July is when they're planning to start the monthly, the monthly delivery mechanism. Um, you know, this is, this is swell. Um, however, a lot of the other things that Biden has advanced, um, I think they're things that like on their face, they sort of seem like sort of uh, like stuff I might like, sort of, you know, um, this kind of post-fusionist, uh, we're going to use um, fiscal policy to provide explicit reinforcement for, uh, for family life and, and for sort of like dignified work and stuff. Um, but I think that it's, it's one of those situations where what we really have is we have kind of the same old policies just getting a rebranding. So like, um, We've got a change to the EITC, and it was certainly proposed, I think it was actually enacted, I'm not 100% sure about, about that, to dramatically increase the generosity for singles. And like, this is in principle, like I'm actually in favor of this. I, I think it's ridiculous that, that we provide an extra labor subsidy if someone's a parent 
But like, if a single person isn't working, we're like, oh, whatever, that's fine. Like society has no interest in, in, in a single person's work because like society does have an interest in, interest in this. Um, but if you only crank up the singles rate, you don't change the, the family rate. Um, what you actually do is you create a bigger marriage penalty. Because right? if you have two working singles, they're both getting a, a real nice single benefit. And they get married and part of it's gone. Um, so this is one of those places where it's like on its face, it's like this seems kind of like a good thing. But when you actually get into like the the uh, the trapezoids of it, so to speak, in, in wonky east, uh, it ends up being really bad. Um, it ends up having really perverse incentive. Um, you know, there's there's stuff like this with the child independent care tax credit too. Like they proposed, I can never keep track of like what things they've proposed to do and what they've actually done. There was this proposal to like double the generosity of it. It's like, oh, this is going to help people pay for childcare. It's like, well, okay, the only people who can use the CDCTC are uh, are all worker households. That is a single parent who works or two parents who both work. Um, and only if their income is high enough to have a tax liability after other credits. Now, the current child care proposal, which is not passed yet, uh, calls to make the CDC TC more refundable, um, which, would, which would deal with the other part, but it's still like, it's only for parents who, who conform to a certain distribution of labor. Um, so this is not, um, this is actually not, a, a good way to do this. Um, so, uh, and of course, of, of course, uh, it can pay for childcare costs, but it can't pay a parent. A parent can't pay themselves through the CDCTC, um, unless I guess if they started a day an institutional daycare and enrolled their own kids, maybe they could. But, uh, yeah. Well, that's an idea. Uh, so. Uh, so there have been things that are like kind of encouraging to see, but on the whole, um, I think it's just sort of repackaging the same old, reshape the American family to make it friendlier to the needs of employers. It's it's basically just that policy agenda in new wrapping paper. Yeah, okay, so that makes sense. And so I guess like, you know, we're all parents here on the video and I'm never the smartest one in the room but when I talk to other sort of normal Joe parents I I don't understand when I'm not having my policy hat on a lot of this stuff like normal non wonky types I mean it's just like okay that somehow sounds good but there's a lot of acronyms and you know it I am exhausted because I've been changing diapers uh, and I just got back from my job like I guess this sounds good but I will I ever see it like maybe right like so what's your perspective on consolidate like why are we addicted to like this weird means testing leveling like why not just cut a check and do direct and, and simplify it right I mean child care is like the perfect example of this right because you've got the um the child care development fund which is a fund that pays for block grant states <laughs> use however they want to subsidize child care for low income people. And then you also have TANF, which look, even as an expert, I don't fully understand if the TANF child care funds are the same as the CCDF child care funds. Um, and then yeah, somehow, that, I sometimes think like, like no one understands that anywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then you have like the child care dependent child dependent care tax credit which is this other thing and then and then biden is also talking about it's it's a little unclear if they're just talking about increasing ccdf and cbctc or if they're also talking about like an additional program to like cap child care expenditure like it's just there's like layers it's it's um it's so complicated so like why why not just um just give uh, a consolidated program and the answer is, um, there's a couple answers. One is the way policy happens. And that is policy happens through compromise. Often not everyone can agree on the, the just one big thing approach. 
Um, so you end up with a compromise where we can't do the, just one big thing. So we do like four littler things that we were able to get people to agree on. It's just, it's just reality. And yeah, it's frustrating to non-experts, but like get over it. We live in a world of compromise. Um, there's going to be complexity. Um, and that's like the, I think the more legitimate argument. Um, uh, the, but then the, the, the other reason, um, or, or a second reason is about how we measure need, right? So like we say things like, like if you give a cat, if you did, if you took all of our child programs, you got rid of them, you replaced them with a cash grant and all the exact same beneficiaries got the exact same amount of spending, but they got it in cash instead of daycare or whatever. Um, some of those families would use it for some other thing, right? They'd use it to pay off housing debt or credit card debt or buy a car or whatever. And then in a survey, they would still report difficulty paying for childcare, right? Because the number of things that a family, the number of challenges a family faces, the number of need of demands on that budget is, is practically unlimited. Um, there's always one more thing that the money can and should go towards. And if, if families have a different preference set than policymakers, which is very likely to occur, it's, it's a certainty to occur in at least some cases, then some of those families are still gonna report stuff that from the policymakers perspective looks like unmet need. So like if they get that money that the policymaker was hoping would go to daycare, and they spend it on instead paying off the car loan, which maybe is very important because they need to use the car to get their kid to something um, or to get themselves to work. The, the, from the policymakers perspective, this wasn't a success, right? because we still have unmet need for daycare. So because need measurement is highly targeted, instead of looking at something very general like subjective well-being or, or life satisfaction um, or, or some more holistic measure, um, you're in this like treadmill where anytime you give people cash, it's less effective at achieving any specific goal because some of the people who get the cash will use it for something they see as a higher priority. So this is often seen as a problem. I see this as, as a, a pro in favor of cash programs. Okay. That the policymaker might be a bad judge of what the family needs and the family might be a better judge. But then this comes to the third reason why we don't do this. Uh, and this is the belief that some people, some parents are very bad judges of what their family needs. Um, and you get this paternalism in various forms. Uh, um, you know, we don't want a parent to use the money we give them to buy drugs. I think pretty much everybody agrees. Child allowances paying for crack would be not a, a good result. Um, but that's, if you're just giving cash, you can't really control. It. Um, and so there is a strong desire not to subsidize adverse outcomes. So this is about loss avoidance, right? That even if 99% of the money may go to things that we all agree are really good, the 1% of the money that goes to stuff we all agree is really bad, uh, looms larger in our minds, mm. in, in the public consciousness, in, and, and frankly, in the way we do audits, right? When you audit a government program, um, you don't, report the 99 times that it worked exactly as planned. Right, right. So the, so this is, reminds me of a couple things, right? So, you know, so zooming out to why there's such a large focus on child policy right now, a big part of that answer seems to be the demographic transition, um, what to expect when no one's expecting, right? This has been a sort of growing part of the discourse over the last few years. The New York Times, for example, I mean, we're recording this on March 24th, and it's going to air probably a little bit later at the convention, but New York Times just had a big front page article about it over the weekend. You've written a lot about this. What is going on? What is the demographic decline, and, and why is it why is it of concern? What, what are the real adverse ramifications of something like society getting more older in general. Yeah. So just at a very high level, 
um, there's kind of two things going on here. One is this like big long run change with like, you can say modernity, right? Where we go from a society uh, where the average woman has about three surviving children, three and a half maybe, um, in a pre-transitional uh, society to a post-transitional one where we think women will have about two surviving children on average. And I should say people are like, oh, before the transition, women had six kids, well, about half of them died. Um, when you actually account for infant and child mortality, the transition is generally a change from about three or four surviving children to about two. Um, so that's, that's the change. Um, that happened in the US between 1870 and 1920. Um, that's when we made that transition. Then during the baby boom after World War II, we had this super anomalous jump back up to like three surviving children per woman. Um, and then it crashed back down. Um, so the baby boom was kind of, um, because the US made this transition a century or more ago. Um, but classically, in sort of the, the very sort of, stead 100 year old demographic paradigm we think that after this transition fertility will oscillate around two children per woman which means population will be approximately stable assuming that immigration and life expectancy don't change if life expectancy increases then even with low fertility population will grow because each generation will live longer and will get older as a society okay so this is what happened, you know, and this is what you see everywhere around the world over the last 50 years, every, every rich country, um, and increasingly lower income countries as well. So this is in some sense very normal. However, what we started to see in the 70s in some countries, uh, and what we've really seen in the last 15 years in a lot of countries, is um, what looks like a strong break below two. That women aren't having about two children per woman. They're having about 1.5. Or in some countries like Korea, for example, they're having about one. Um, this suggests long run population decline. Now you can stave it off for a while if your population is getting healthier or immigration rates are high, but in the long run, it's still decline. Um, in the US, uh, our life expectancies are Pretty static. They have not risen much, which means we're not getting benefits that way. Uh, and our immigration adjusted for total for, uh, replacement rate fertility is about 1.8. So if we have 1.8 babies on average, we'll have about stable population. Right now, fertility is about 1.6, um, which means over the next 40 years, 50 years or something, we can expect American population to peak and begin to decline. Um, now, will birth rates really stay at their low level right now? Probably not, because these are sort of uniquely bad times. On the other hand, fertility rates were falling from 2014 to 2019 when economic times were good. Um, we don't yet fully understand what's driving the current decline in many countries. And um, there's not a clear, clear solution, uh, which means we can likely expect uh, lowish fertility for a long time to come. So a lot of people are comfortable with uh, talking about policy that's meant to help parents in a material way in terms of making it easier to raise children and, you know, and to maintain um, a household against, you know, the high cost of childcare and that kind of thing. Which oh, is what we've been. Patrick, you're frozen for me. I don't know if that's. Okay. Is, He's frozen it, for me too. Is the, uh, is the audio coming through? Okay. Patrick, do you maybe want to kill your video and throw your question in the chat and I can read it? Um, yeah. Is, is the audio back? Okay. Yeah, I can hear yeah, you now. I... Okay. Yeah. I'll start again. Um, what, what I was saying was, um, so, so a lot of people are really comfortable with the kind of policy discussion that you guys have been having when it comes to making things easier for families uh, in immediate material terms, you know, um, alleviating the cost of childcare and so on. But when you start talking about 
a explicitly pronatal policy. It makes some people uncomfortable, uh, especially on the left, but sometimes also on, on the more libertarian right, because they think, okay, well, this is a really personal decision. Why is it policymakers' business how many kids you know American women are having? Uh, so, you know, it's an, an intensely personal issue. What's politics got to do with it? I mean, what's your response to that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so pronatal is an interesting term. Um, and there's, there's two ways you can think about it. One way of thinking about it is um, sort of a, uh, what I would call a strict or strong pronatalism, which is you want people to have more babies. And that would be true virtually no matter what. Uh, Alternatively, that's what I would call a weak pronatalism. That is, you want people to have more babies right now, but there might be conditions under which your position would change. You'd say, okay, enough babies, right? Um, I think the strong pronatalist argument uh, is a very difficult sell politically. That pretty much everyone in America, by pretty much everyone, I mean like 90% of the population, does believe that it is licit and reasonable to limit fertility in some circumstances. The share of the population that thinks that this is fundamentally illicit is extremely small. So that strong pronatalist argument is never politically win. However, a weak pronatalist argument is I think quite persuasive to people. You say, look, I'm not saying everybody needs to have six babies. I'm saying right now, Women on average say they want to have two or three kids is what the vast majority of people say. That's reasonable. This is not crazy. This isn't like everybody saying I want to get it. Like saying or two or three kids is reasonable. And of course they could just go and have those kids. Like nobody's like stopping you. But this would create significant loss of, of uh, well-being. What we mean by well-being is basically relative income, relative status, and relative consumption. And the reason relative matters is that pretty much everybody judges their own well-being according to their neighbors. This might be a bad thing. We might not like this about humans, but the reality is we all judge our lives according to the yardstick of what appears possible in our context. And what appears possible in our context is different than what appeared possible 200 years ago. So saying, well, you could just have the kids and be poor, is not really an argument because the welfare cost is much larger to the same absolute level of poverty. A person at $30,000 of income today feels much worse about it than a person at $30,000 of income 75 years ago. That person 75 years ago was quite wealthy. They felt good about their income. Um, so, so this is really important. That is, as our society changes, um, the, and particularly as the opportunity cost of having children rises, that is, as incomes rise and children necessarily, in almost all circumstances, uh, have a negative hit on your disposable income, um, uh, children get more expensive, even if they're like fixed, even if they're like technical dollar cost is, is relatively stable, um, the opportunity cost rises directly with rising incomes, right? Um, which is to say, um, when somebody says, you know, why should I subsidize the decision? You say, well, if they're truly a libertarian, maybe you should right? But you can say, look, we provide public education. Why do we provide public education? It's because we recognize that without children being well-educated, we have no future. No one's going to pay for our retirement. Even, even aside from social security, someone, if, if I'm using my house as a savings vehicle, someone needs to buy my house. And for them to be able to do that, they need a job. And for them to have a job, they need an education, right? Or if you're relying on the stock market, Maybe I'm invested in a company and the company makes hot dogs. The company is only valuable if someone buys the hot dogs. For them to buy the hot dog, they need a job to pay for it. For them to have a job to pay for it, they need an education. Well, just take that back one step farther. For them to get an education, they must exist. Okay? That is, 
if you're truly like an anarchist libertarian, okay, like do your, you go live on your own. But for those of us who live in a society, um, we recognize that there is a degree of interdependence, interconnection between generations. Um, and so the next generation must exist. Moreover, um, even for a libertarian, I would argue that this creates uh, a, a right. Um, it creates in some sense an entitlement. That is, if your plan for the future, if your retirement planning, if your actions are only coherent, if other people bear a certain cost, that is, if you are planning for your retirement by saving, by buying gold ingots, right? And, and your plan is when you retire, you're going to sell these to someone. Whatever is necessary for other people to do for your gold ingots to still have a resale value when you retire, they have a right to do. And they have a right to de make demands of you to do it if you intend to sell your gold ingots. Now, there's a time problem here that you intend to sell your gold ingots very far in the future, and the problems are now. So coordinating this is extremely difficult. And I would agree with libertarians that there's this information problem, there's a coordination problem. But fundamentally, if you intend to sell your ingots in the future, you are creating, you are, you are relying on other people bearing the cost of ensuring that there will be buyers in the future. And if you want to sell those ingots, you're going to have to make sure there are buyers. So you're going to have to, you're going to, have to pay for it somewhere. So even for this strict libertarian who only wants to recognize like contract rights, um, the contract they intend to make in the future, uh, which is not written yet, intends to write it, can create moral obligations in the present. Okay, so let me let me ask a follow up question to that because I think this is a really interesting. That so going back to the soft natalist position, right? Um, yeah, so so what you mentioned about fertility matches to the stats I have on sort of global population growth from sort of two point two percent in the seventies down to one point zero five more recently. But if we zoom that time scale out, you might say we went from a billion people in 1800 to, you know, we're pushing 9 billion right now, or we released the eight until like 2013 or something. So if we go down a little bit and get a little bit grayer, what's the problem? You know, like why, why be a soft natalist right now? That's a good question. Um, so there are a couple of there are a couple of questions here. The first is an assessment of that change from one billion to nine. Was it good? I would say it was good. I would say this was a good thing. Yes, there are costs, but fundamentally, assuming people have a standard of living that, that they regard as worth living, more people is a good thing. Right? Like, if you can have one person who thinks their life is valuable and worth living, or you can have two people who, thinks, who think their, their lives are valuable and worth living, I would rather have the two people than the one. Very simple. Um, now, you could get to a point in principle where you have so many people and they're consuming the resource in such a way that a very large share of people think their life is not valuable and not worth living. You could get to that point in principle. You can imagine, but we're not there. The vast majority of people in the world think their life is worth living. Suicide rates are not at especially high historic levels around the world. Um, in the US, they're a bit high, but around the world, they're not especially high. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, so I, I am not worried that we are close to a point where there's a 
a fundamental population problem. That is um, that people do not regard their own lives as worth living because uh, there's just too much resource competition. Okay, maybe there's a few places in the world or maybe there's a few people who feel that way, but, but this is not the, the modal human state right now. So then if there's not gonna be a fundamental population problem, then we get sort of second order population problems. Like, um, do, does this population create problems for other people or for other non-human life? Is it driving extinctions or, uh, or, re, or uh, habitat loss? Are we being bad stewards? And I would argue, yes, we're being bad stewards of, of the world, I would say of creation. Um, but uh, but th this actually has almost nothing to do with population. Um, a lot of very sparsely populated states and countries have very poor management of their resource, of their natural resources. And a lot of rather densely populated places do not appear to have ongoing habitat. Loss. So for example, in the US and Europe, forest coverage is rising, okay? Um, and we're very densely populated. Forest coverage is actually even rising now in China. Um, and they're very densely populated. Forest coverage is declining uh, in a lot of poor countries. And it's not declining because of population growth. It's declining because of poor policy, weak institutions, uh, weak property rights, um, or in some cases, excessively strong property rights relating to prior colonial systems that created property rights that were practically untouchable by governments. Um, what we basically see is that the pace of habitat degradation um, and, uh, uh, and, and related issues is entirely driven by policy choices that can be made at any population level. And in many cases, low population densities give rise to bad, to bad environmental policies. That is, when your natural world is so abundant that how could you possibly exhaust it? You do not bother to take care of it. Then we get to these other bigger collective action problems like climate change. Um, and again here, is population the problem? I would say no. Um, I've written extensively about this elsewhere, but suffice to say, Countries that have more restrictive population policies 30 or 40 years ago have not seen slower growth in carbon emissions to the present day. This strategy failed because maybe you do succeed in reducing population growth, but usually countries that restrict population growth do so in the hope that it will juice per capita economic growth. It's the economic growth that's driving energy use and emissions, not population. It's, it's economic output and consumption. So um, all these reasons to be opposed to a rising population, I don't think are very compelling. I think there is a, 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 an obvious reason to be in favor of population growth. Uh, and that is that provided everybody thinks that, that their life is worth living, more is better. Um, uh, and, and finally, you know, we know approximately the energy potential of the Earth. That is, we know the combined energy output of our planetary core and the sunlight that hits us. Um, if we were able to capture all of it using current sort of like uh, transmission and generation technologies, um, we would probably have enough energy for about 20 billion people at a rich country standard of living. We are nowhere close to that. So we can do it. Doing so would be fundamentally good. There's no reason to oppose it. And people continue to desire fertility rates of two or three children each. And we should enable that reasonable desire. I wanna be, um... Uh, slightly cheeky and, and tee up a question for you that uh, you'll hear uh, from critics of pronatal policy, maybe not not always uh, necessarily in good faith, I think, but I, but I think it's an important question, um, which is uh, you, you see the birth rate sometimes being put in opposition with immigration as a source of maintaining population levels. 
And so if you care about how many babies are born in the United States, is that, isn't that maybe just a little bit racist? So it makes you think about people like, uh, you know, Congressman Steve King, who came under a lot of criticism for saying things like, oh, we can't preserve our civilization with somebody else's babies, which, you know, people took that to be flirting with white nationalism. Um, and so if, if you reject that viewpoint, uh, what is the point of pronatal policy, right? Why not just yeah. more immigration? So there's a couple of reasons why, why not more immigration. First of all, I would say, yes, more immigration. You know what? Legally, like well-regulated, legally appropriate immigration is a blessing to the country that receives it. Um, having people who want to come to your country benefit from the fruits of your institutions and contribute to, to those institutions is a true blessing. Um, and so we should welcome it. That is why we should have immigration. We should not have immigration because our society is so dysfunctional that we cannot enable our families to achieve their own goals. So we're going to bring in immigrants to solve the problem we couldn't solve ourselves. That is not a good reason for immigration. And frankly, telling immigrants, look, we can't get our house in order. So we'd like to have you come here to prop it up for a few more years before it collapses. I'm not even sure that's an ethical argument to make to that immigrant. Additionally, my argument for pronatalism, this weak pronatalism, right? Which I, weak sounds pejorative. I don't mean it pejoratively. I, it's, it's, I'm just saying that it's, it's conditional. Um, is that we should be pronatal because birth rates are far below what women say they want and what parent, what, what men as well say they want. I just focus on women because one, they have, somewhat more reliable statistics, and, and two, because um, practically speaking, they're the ones whose bodies bear the brunt of the difficulty of, of this, this question. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, people say that they want two or three kids. That's reasonable. Um, you could bring in however many immigrants you want. It's not going to change that equation, right? Like, great, bring in more immigrants. You'll prop up the population. Social security will be solvent for 20 more years. Lovely, wonderful, I'm good with it, but you still have a problem of people not achieving the life they wanted to achieve. Um, they're still not having the family life they desire. Uh, and that is a problem that, that is, is meritorious on its own. Finally, um, if you invite in immigrants, uh, to sort of prop up your labor pool. Uh, this, is, this is fine. Um, but the thing about immigrants is that they are human beings uh, and they do get old as well. Um, and if they come here and they also have relatively low fertility, which increasingly is the case, you've postponed your problem, which is great, but you, you have not eliminated it. In fact, when the bill comes due, the bill is bigger because the population is larger. So, um, and the bill will come due because immigration cannot continue forever. Immigration is driven by having poor countries with lots of babies and rich countries with not so many babies. But increasingly, there are fewer poor countries because those countries are getting richer. And also, they're not having as many babies. Fertility rates are falling everywhere. And there are more and more countries that are rich and don't have babies. And so there's more competition to receive immigrants, and there's a drying up supply of immigrants. So for all these reasons, while I am in favor of, of, uh, of increased levels of well-regulated and legal immigration, um, uh, it is not a solution to low fertility. It is, a, it is a, a solution to some of the social problems arising from low fertility, but it is not a solution to low fertility itself. Okay, so, so what I'm hearing is um, there are some sort of unique arguments for the natalist position uh, there's the sort of what women want argument, right? Like, so we don't currently make it, uh, super easy for women to fulfill the life they want and their preferences they want according to how they self-report. So 
if we could do that, they'd be happier. And then, uh, you know, I, you know, I still have some questions on the soft versus strong natalism. If your, you know, life happiness margin is not committing suicide and the planet can support up to 20 billion people, no problem. You know, I, th I think that that sounds like a recipe for as many babies as uh, we can get anyone to have for the foreseeable future. So, but, but leaving that aside, right? Cause I don't wanna get on a rabbit hole. The, I, these are unique to me because if I go back to the New York Times article, for example, it's like the most um, common things I see people, see people say about the demographic decline and getting older, it's very negative arguments. Like we need to increase fertility to avoid the dire consequences of a graying society. So right. that doesn't, you haven't focused on that so far, but what do, I hear a lot of general talk about the dire consequences of a graying society, but could you help our listeners, could you paint a picture for them of what that would actually look like? What, what would change in our lives day to day and societies if current trends continue? So, um... I don't talk a lot about the dire social consequences of low fertility. And the reason is, um, so imagine for a moment that you look out your window uh, in your neighborhood and you see a tank rolling down your street. And you stick it out the window and you say, why are you here? And they say, we're here to keep you safe. You don't feel safer. Because you go, why do you need a tank to keep me safe? Like, what is wrong? There's a similar problem in pronatalism. That we do this like, you need to have babies because otherwise the future will be awful. And it's like, wait, but if I'm the only parent who listens to this and I have a baby, my child is going to grow up in the future you just told me is going to be awful, right? It's like, it's this like sort of catch 22 that, trying to get people to do this very future-minded thing, having babies, by telling them how awful the future is going to be um, is, is stupid. Like, this will never work. You cannot fear people into having babies. Um, so that's why I don't focus on this, because I don't think it's persuasive. Um, and secondly, I do think the most important argument is not the social consequences, but the individual consequences. That is, if a society wants to be poorer and working longer years of their life and more unequal and less dynamic and more vulnerable and have more reactionary politics, I guess they have a right to that uh, because those will be the outcomes of durably low fertility. Um, I guess a society is entitled to make that choice. Um, but the individual element is where you really have this, this mismatch of what people clearly want. Um, so all that said, though, there are negative consequences of very low fertility in the long run. Um, I've talked a bit about this intergenerational transfer idea. We think about it with social security and Medicare. And like, those are real problems. Um, but in some levels, in some way, they're policy. The bigger problem is that low fertility reduces the rate of return on everything in society. The slower population growth is, the slower economic growth will be. The result is um, just less economic churn in general. This means less economic mobility. This means higher importance of intergenerational wealth. Uh, this means um, lower odds that you'll be better off than your parents. This means less entrepreneurship, less innovation, less patenting. This means um, uh, I mean, I can go on. I mean, imagine imagine a world where uh, where population is steadily declining, and so the average house has declining real value over time. What happens to your mortgage? What happens if houses are no longer savings vehicles? This becomes a problem. Um, what happens when your highest return, when your highest returning asset is cash? Well, 
no need to hold bank deposits. Just fill a safe in your house with cash. But suddenly, like physical robbery would would, would be a huge economic issue again. Um, so you get all sorts of problems with this sort of low growth society. It ultimately becomes a Malthusian society. That is, we know what a zero population growth society looks like because this was human society for thousands of years before the industrial revolution. And the answer is aristocracy. It's, it's lords and peasants. Um, it's no growth. Nothing changes for thousands of years. I mean, not literally nothing changes. In fact, much change, but, but that's what you get. Um, you get societies of elite extraction. Also, like lots of people dying alone and spending decades of loneliness near the end of their life and, and not enjoying the, the moments of joy and happiness associated with youth and, and all this stuff. So like the, the costs of this are, are, are numerous and occur at many levels. Um, but, uh, but again, I think no one is going to be persuaded to have a baby because they need to do it for the economy. Um, so when we talk about this, yeah, I mean, there's real costs, but, um, what we, what we should be thinking about is how can we enable people to get the things they already say they want? So one criticism of uh, pronatal policy is, you know, regardless of what people say they want, uh, it does seem that there are these really strong long-term, you know, cultural headwinds uh, against fertility that lead people to maybe to want fewer children or, or even if they want them to, you know, to value them less against other goals, right? Um, and so how do we know what the limits to policy are in this area? So we don't know. We don't know what the limits of policy are. Um, I don't think that's a reason not to try. Um, I think saying we don't know how much we can raise fertility is not a reason to not attempt. Um, especially since we have lots of documented cases of many countries successfully increasing their fertility rates through pronatal policy. Um, so it's, it's certainly not a reason not to try. But on this question of like, people say they want this, but do they really want it? You know, people say, well, I want a million dollars, but that doesn't mean anything. Or I want a yacht, but that doesn't mean anything. Or they say, we should, we should look at revealed preferences. And however many kids they really have is revealed preferences. But this is not true. First of all, for a, re for a revealed preference model, you would need to see how many kids people do, how many kids do people say they want, how many kids do people actually have? And then is there a difference in their life satisfaction or well-being? So if you see that everybody has fewer kids than they say they want, that is not a revealed preference. You would then need to also see that people who had a bigger gap between the number they had and the number they say they wanted were no less happy or indeed happier than other people. That would show a revealed preference, okay? So that's just people... People say these words revealed preference and they have no idea what, that, what it means. They think that it just means anything that is, is necessarily what people desire. Um, but that is, that is not what a revealed preference model is. Um, but secondly, this idea that what's really happened is people just value other things more, there is some truth to it. And so I've, I've done some work on this, particularly looking at people's attitudes towards career and work. And I find that as people value a meaningful career more highly, they tend to have fewer, they tend to desire, to desire to have and to actually have fewer children. This is very important because the point is this causes them to desire to have fewer children, which is to say this would be reflected in lower fertility preferences. But since we actually still observe relatively high fertility preferences, that's not the vehicle we're talking about. So the problem is a lot of these, well, social values have changed and people desire other things now. Yes, that's true, but that should show up as lower stated fertility preferences. If people actually just don't desire it as much, 
So then you have to get into a story of, well, it's not that they, they stop desiring it, they desire these other incompatible things. Okay, maybe what we actually observe is that uh, as countries get richer, they do not tend to place a lower priority on family in terms of self-rated, but they do tend to place a lower priority on a lot of other things. That is, as countries get richer, their self-presentation -present tends to often become somewhat more familistic, not less. Um, and secondly, we have a lot of surveys where we ask people about their life priorities. Um, and it turns out people who value family more highly, um, who say they value family more highly, uh, do not tend to have a different mismatch between their fertility preferences and their fertility outcomes. That is, the mismatch is not driven by differential prioritization of family versus leisure time or, or you know, social life or work or something like that. Empirically, this does not appear to be the driving force, which is to say this idea that like, well, this is sort of a, this is like not a, a deeply held desire for people is bunk. Um, these fertility preferences are deeply held. I actually presented a paper just last week at the Canadian Population Society um, showing that um, unintended births do have meaningful negative consequences for women's fertility. That is a birth higher than the number of children that a woman says she wants to have. Um, but an, an intended birth, that is when a woman expected to have another child and then she does, lead to durable increases in her habits. That we can directly test this. But it turns out having kids you want to have increases your happiness over a decade. Um, so uh, um, so this, this whole view that these, these preferences are like spurious in some sense, uh, it's just wrong. These preferences are meaningfully associated with, with people's happiness in real data of real people's lives. Um, and uh, um, now excess fertility is also a problem. Having kids you don't wanna have is, is, is problematic um, for, for happiness. Um, but, but these are real preferences that the people actually do care about. They're, they're not castles in the air. Now, when somebody says, oh, I wanna have 11 kids. Okay, maybe, maybe that is not as totally serious respondent, um, but, the vast majority of people are saying one, two, three, or four. This is the over, this is like, I forget exactly, but I think it's like 80 or 90% of responses are in that range. All right, so let me, let me shift gears here to the sort of elephant in the room when we think about the population explosion and some of these conversations, which is something you've written a little bit about climate change, right? And, and your background um, started as an agricultural economist, right? So see, you know, increasingly the dialogue seems to be around the, the dire urgency of acting in the next 10 years to avoid the worst emissions pathway scenarios. Um, what do you think about climate change as an issue? How concerned are you? And what's your... It, you know, it sounds like you're still in favor of an economic growth model and the fundamental system we've we've built that sustains the high population we have now. Um, that would probably get a lot of pushback and criticism for from, from climate activists who favor that pre-1800 societal model with some uh, egalitarian modifications. Let's say, what's your what's your take? So I actually I gave a talk about this at uh, California State University of Sacramento a few years back um, about the ethics of having children. And I, I came on to talk about the environmental ramifications of childbearing. Um, I, I can, so I, I could wax on about this for an entire weekend if you'd like. But, um, but fundamentally, and I mentioned this earlier, countries that enacted more population control decades ago have not had lower emissions trajectories. The classic example is China. Strictest population policy in the world there for a while, fastest growth in emissions. You know why? Because restricting population 
does not necessarily, it can, but it doesn't necessarily reduce economic growth, particularly at the low level, at low levels of economic growth. Um, uh, so at a high level of economic development and at a global scale, lower population growth reduces economic growth. But at a very low level, when there's a lot of subsistence, uh, agriculture, um, lower population growth can sometimes be economically advantageous. Um, so first of all, just like as a strategy, it doesn't work, okay? Um, secondly, uh, more broadly about climate change, I should say right up front, I believe in climate change. I believe in anthropogenic climate change. I accept all of the consensus models that, that we have, I think that it is urgent and we need significant action in the very near term. Um, but if you look at the IPCC's um, reports on this, they don't recommend any population. Policies. Like there's, there's no scientific consensus on population policy. And the reason is not that they were afraid to touch it. The reason is that the issue is urgent. So if you think about population policy, when would population policy reduce emissions? 30 years from now. Okay? It does nothing today. Nothing. In fact, it makes today worse. Because guess what? Dollar for dollar, spending on baby stuff is a lower emission than spending on non-baby stuff. Diapers are lower carbon emissions per dollar spent than wine or fancy cheese or airplane tickets, or whatever. Minivans are more carbon efficient than uh, than small than like than um, than a lot of moderately smaller cars. Now, if you're talking like a hybrid smaller car, or whatever. But um, uh, controlling for like engine type here, um, and particularly when you count for how many people are in that minivan on a per person basis, um, there is no evidence that having a child causes a household's carbon footprint to increase. And the reason you can know this intuitively is that having a child does not increase your income, okay? It doesn't. Your consumption footprint is still driven by the same budget constraint as it was before. In fact, often your budget constraint is lower because sometimes, sometimes one parent leaves work, okay? So this idea that having a, chill, a child is this like huge carbon footprint is totally bogus. And you can look at the academic research under it and realize that they, it, they're not showing the carbon footprint of a child. They're showing the carbon legacy of a child. The carbon legacy of a child is a, a mathematical fabrication. It's not actual carbon outputs. It's adding up all the descendants of that child and then allocating shares of them to current people. And it's like, Okay, but like when those descendants are born, we may have different technology that has like different carbon and the world may be the difference. Like we need to reduce emissions now, like right now, like immediately. Um, and in, in this, one of the most important things we can do to reduce emissions is maintain stable energy markets. So when you think about um, energy switching, like let's say we want to turn off a coal plant. That'd be great for the environment. But to do that, we need to replace it with something because there's still energy demand. So let's say we want to replace it with um, a hydroelectric dam. Okay. Building the dam is expensive, right? Which means you're only going to build it if you get good return on investment. But you're only going to get good return on investment if you have a growing market. You're only going to have a growing market if you have a growing economy or a growing population, which is why in West Virginia, they keep extending the life of coal plants because there's not a growing market. But in Arizona, you can turn that coal plant off and build a solar farm because guess what? There's a growing market for energy in Arizona. So, um, when you, when you actually think about the business side of energy switching, you need the market to be growing because otherwise it becomes more cost effective to just, just roll over, just, you know, just, just refurbish that coal plant a little bit. Um, now there are 
uh, applications to this case. The rapid growth in Africa has led to a massive increase in coal plant construction. Um, however, uh, a considerable part of that is just because China really wants to keep their steel and concrete coal industries afloat. And so they use their Belt and Road Initiative to subsidize their coal, steel, and, and concrete industries. And there's nothing their coal, steel, and concrete industries love more than building power plants because it uses tons of all those things. Um, so I would argue that the real issue going on in Africa is not their rapid energy demand growth per se, but just Chinese industrial policy. Um, and I would note that even in the US case, the problem for US emissions is not that our population or economy is growing too fast. It's just not the problem. Partly, we're already reducing our emissions. So like mission accomplished. But the real problem is policy. We all know this. The problem is we should have a carbon tax. That's the problem. That is politically difficult to do. But acting like you're going to have some individual, like self flagellating solution to the collective action problem of climate change as a substitute for policy is nonsense. If you choose not to have that child, okay, fine, you're going to turn around and spend the money on something just as carbon intense. And by the way, a similar thing actually applies to like vegetarianism as well. You choose not to eat that meat. Okay, you just lowered demand for meat, which means price shifted a little bit lower. But guess what? There is a highly price sensitive consumer in China or Indonesia who will buy that meat. So speaking of the self-flagellating, um, I, I wanna connect this issue of climate change back to uh, fertility preferences um, because anecdotally, uh, anecdotally, at least you hear a lot of people uh, in the news saying, well, you know, I." I don't want to have kids e either because they see it as a form of environmental activism or on a more fundamental level, they have a kind of pessimism about the kind of world that they think their kids are going to grow up in, um, especially because of climate change. And um, so as someone who has studied the preferences issue in depth, is that a real thing on a large scale? That is a great question. Um, I actually just, I have a survey that I field every six months or so of reproductive age women in the U.S., and I ask about climate change um, in the survey. Um, and what I find uh, is that um, women who are worried about overpopulation do have lower fertility preferences, lower fertility intentions, and lower fertility outcomes, even with lots of other controls. But women who are worried about climate change do not have lower fertility preferences. And these are not the same women. There's overlap. So if you think of a Venn diagram, there are women who are worried about both. And there are women who are worried about climate change, but not overpopulation. And these women tend to be fairly pronatal. They have somewhat high fertility preferences. And my theory on what's going on is these are people like me or my wife. We want to have a lot of babies. And therefore, we worry about the future. Like. Duh, <laughs> I am worried about climate change because my children will experience it. And then on the other hand, you get people who are worried about overpopulation, but not climate change. What are these people worried about? They're worried about food shortages. They're worried about too much traffic. And I can say some of them are worried about too many black people. Um, they're worried about who is having those babies. So a lot of the actual beliefs driving low fertility preferences are not what we would call uh, far left views. They are in many cases views we would identify as far right. They're associated with radical individualist preferences. That is, uh, an, I would say a non-solidaristic view of family or they are associated with straightforwardly racist preferences. Um, and an astonishingly large share of them are associated with cars. Um, that is, people say that they're just like, traffic is like a huge issue. And they're like, like, no more people, there's too much traffic, which that's the one that I'm just like, have you not heard of trains? Um, but yeah. So uh, 
you know, climate change, it probably matters. There, there's probably some element of climate change reducing fertility preferences, but this, this is not a huge, this is not actually a huge factor. So that brings us back to policy again, huge one with, with urbanism and cars and, and density and all this, all this stuff. But, you know, Thomas Friedman, remember he wrote that, that chapter article, or whatever it was like China for a day, you know, and he still loves democracy, but he wants to be king for a day and, and just make all these quick policy changes that we need to that, that our institutions are unable to do. So what's, what's the policy approach for fixing our approach to policy? You know, like, how can we make, we've known about many of these changes for a long time, right? Like in the, in the policy community, but politically, and everyone's like talking about, well, but what's politically the politics of it, but, you know, and that just seems to have been getting worse and worse for the whole time we've been talking about these solutions, yeah. right? So what's your, what's your prognosis for that? What, where do you think we're, what's your realistic guess about where some of this stuff is headed? And, you know, I have no anything guess. you think we can do? Um, I have no forecast. Uh, I think if there's one thing we've learned from the last 20 years of American politics, it's that any attempt to forecast the future uh, is, is unwise. Um, so I don't know where policy is going to go. But in terms of like, can we solve the messiness of policy? No. Uh, we are humans. It's messy. Get used to it. Deal with it. Get down in the weeds and learn to pull them up. If you do not have patience for working with other humans in their humanness, like grow up. Um, the the whole complaint about like oh it's um, it's just impossible to do anything now. No, it's not. Things get done. Things happen. We have a child allowance happening. Um, and it's like oh it took a pandemic to do that. No, it didn't. It took what. 53 senators or something like it is possible to make changes things do happen history does move um i think confessing a kind of defeatism is unwise now is it harder than in the past maybe are there more voices clamoring for attention perhaps you know but there is a lot that can be done at the state level there's a lot that can be done at the local level um, I study pronatal policy. A lot of the a lot of the pronatal policy cases that get studied are not national policies. They're policies enacted by by subnational units, by states or provinces, or cities or counties. Um, you know, if there's something you want to see done, make it happen. Get off your butt. Go to city hall talk to your legislator, talk to whoever, you know, tweet up a storm, whatever you need to do, get out there and do it. Okay, so let's go, this is a good, this is a good next point. So, you know, the pushback on that would be the, this growing line on both left and right about the, the elites, uh, the elite neoliberals who are able to run everything and who are removed from what you might do as an average citizen in terms of electoralism or advocacy work, et cetera, et cetera. Are you sympathetic to that? Or are you still holding the, the liberal uh, standard in, against the rising tides of, of post-liberalism? Or what's your take on, on all this discourse that we've been seeing? You know, there are elites who have disproportionate influence. That's true. And in the first few elections in the U.S., less than 2% of the population voted. So maybe it's harder to get things done now than in some previous period. But it is not as hard for the average person now to 
make their voice heard as it was in 1820. Now, the voice of the three of us might be a little bit more diluted. That is, I'm assuming, property holding white men. Uh, perhaps it would have been easier for us to make our voices heard in, in 1820. Um, but for most people, it's gotten a lot easier to make your voice heard. Um, so, of course, the problem is that there's, there's just a lot more voices nowadays. Um, so you might have to work harder. I don't know, like instead of, you might have to work harder. So like your ancestors had to do really easy things like fight a revolution or fight a civil war. You might have to like, you know, go to Washington DC twice a year and knock on a congressman's door with like a hundred of your friends. I mean, I know it's asking a lot. Your ancestors died for this, but should you really have to call someone? Calling someone on the phone is very difficult for a millennial. How could you do such a thing? It's so difficult. But I guess you could take up your cross and bear this trial and found a nonprofit organization in your community to promote things you think are good. It would be asking a lot. But, you know, the Lord's help, perhaps we can suffer and write letters home to Ma about the difficulty on the front lines of the policy debate. Like, okay, it's not that hard, okay? I am a no one with a Twitter account. Like, I don't, I never, I don't have some big pull, bully pulpit, okay? And yet, like, things get read. They're, they're, like, it is possible to get your thoughts in front of the eyeballs of people who make decisions. And if you are persuasive, you will persuade some of them. And you might not persuade all of them, but if you don't persuade all of them, perhaps your children will persuade all of them or your children's children. You are not engaged in a political project of four years, but of 400 years. And in that, I would say, yes, I am waving the liberal flag. I am waving it proudly. This is a centuries long project of making a more perfect union. Um, and so like, yeah, I might not see my political project fully accomplished. So what? My ancestors didn't see their political project fully accomplished. That is life. Well, uh, Tim, what do you think with that uh, stirring exhortation, we might uh, start drawing things to a close? I think that's a great uh, moment to end on. I really do. You know, it's uh, Lyman Stone, one of the most talented voices who's uh, still going long on the American project. So it's good to see, uh, it's good to see a patriotic American waving the flag. Um, so everyone, Get out there and have more babies and join the ASP. And, you know, yeah, let's let's get off our, our butts and, and get some stuff done. You know, join a third party, work to change the system. Maybe, uh, Patrick, any any closing thoughts from the national chair of the ASP? But I, I've just been thrilled, Lyman, with having you on. Yeah, I, I don't think I can improve on that. Um, but I, I do really appreciate uh, you being here, Tim, and, and especially Lyman. I've, I've wanted to uh, do this for a long time. So we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us. My pleasure. Good to talk to you.